You know, for the last 10 episodes, we've been doing openings on our shows by doing interpretive readings of one of the comic book ads. And it's got me thinking about how they incorporate into the story of the comic book. What do you mean? Well, it is a break in the storyline. I know that in some of the older comics, they would actually do a full two-page ads in the middle of a story, and the editors would actually state something like, continued following the ads prior to the break. Yeah, we even saw that happen in issue two, and we commented on how the two-page yellow ad was followed by the kids in an all-yellow room. Right. Since neither of us is in the comic industry, and we don't even know how these books are built, I was wondering if the artists or creators have a say in the ad layout, or if they even try to work it into their stories. Well, if only we had someone we could ask. We can. Like, right now. Hey, June Brigman, what are your thoughts on ad placement in comic books and how it impacts your art in the story? Are there ads in comics? <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be very, very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, dear listener, to our podcast, Jeff and Rick present Unpacking the Power of Power Pack, where we are usually journeying through each issue of the most underrated Marvel series of the 80s while drinking beer, analyzing awesome and amazing adolescent adventures, and absorbing alcohol. I am Jeff. And I am Rick. And welcome to our first interview. This is really exciting for us. When we started this show, we had always dreamed and hoped that one day we would be able to talk to one of the creators. And here we are at episode 12, actually making that happen. Welcome to our little love letter to the Power Pack, June Bergman. I should explain to you and any new listeners that we have that we record a show where we walk through each issue of Power Pack, retelling the story as it is presented with some funny asides, followed by a discussion about some of the themes, the interactions with the kids, the art and story, and some context of the time. We also put out some science and literary questions from each issue, since there seems to be a heavy focus on both. We also like to rank some of the outstanding art, insults, and who the best and worst children of the issue are. Our main goal is to provide some entertainment and introspection on the comic that many people love. And just in case anyone listening doesn't know how wonderful you are, would you mind introducing yourself and explaining what your connection to Power Pack is? Uh, well, my connection is uh, I am a, a co-creator with Louise Simonson. Uh, Louise came up with the, the basic concept for the book, and then I came up with the uh, character designs, and then we just we started making the, the comic book. I, I am a penciler, which means um, I, I am the first step in the artwork phase of a comic book. And then after I'm done drawing it, I would hand it off to the inker, who in this case was um, Bob Wyacek. Uh, so it, it was definitely a team effort. That brings us to really our first question is, how did you get into art and drawing? Uh, I, I always loved to draw as a child. That was pretty much how I entertained myself. Um, the first thing I learned to draw was horses because I was one of those like really, you know, crazy horse geek girls and uh yeah and i i didn't have any horses so um you know i i guess i fulfilled my my uh horse jones by drawing them learning to draw horses and um i just i you know had just always loved drawing um uh, and uh i i knew i wanted to major in art when i got to college but i had really no idea what i i wanted to do with it i thought maybe i'd go into advertising or illustration it had never occurred to me to work in comics i'm kind of curious because you said that you always loved horses but you didn't have any horses did you have any other influences that kind of helped lead you towards that towards towards comics i didn't read comics as a child uh, I didn't grow up reading comics. I, I, it wasn't like I was forbidden uh, or anything. Um, I just didn't, wasn't interested. If there had been comics about a girl and her horse, I probably would have read comics. Uh, but I didn't know of any like that. Um, I, I didn't really discover comics until um, I was uh, just starting college and I was dating a guy who was really into comics who um, eventually became my husband and uh, art partner in crime, uh, Roy Richardson. And uh, he had a huge comic book collection, and he kind of introduced me to comics. Um, one of the first books I remember really being impressed by was um, uh, a New Gods book, Kirby Fourth World stuff. Uh, I, I was really amazed by that. And then he took me to a comic book convention, and I met some other professionals and saw them drawing, and I thought – 
this looks like a whole lot more fun than working in advertising. And uh, I always loved to draw. And so that was that was kind of how I got the bug. Your husband got you into comics and you really fell in with uh, the Kirby set, which is pretty great. Uh, how about current influences? Uh, who Who is your favorite and current loves? Oh, gosh, there's so many. I mean, there are a lot of amazing artists uh, that I, I love that are currently working in comics. Um, but from, I guess, my early influences were people like uh, Gil Kane and uh, Bernie Wrightson, Joe Kubert, Walt Simonson. Um, I still I still look at Walt's work for his, his storytelling and composition. Um and there, there's just so many, so many amazing artists that are working in comics. I'm just, you know, it's, uh, it still uh, astounds me some of the work that's being done. But I, I would say those guys, those guys are, are probably my, my early influence. Talking, talking about Walt Simonson, I know that you, of course, worked with Louise Simonson, but Walt would be uh, kind of a peer. Did you ever have any work that you did? directly with Walt where you guys shared a lot of the uh, art or storytelling? No, uh, unfortunately, no. Um, he, he inked one cover I did. It was an Alpha Flight cover and uh, Loki, it, it had Loki on it. And uh, I somehow conned him into inking it. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the only time we, we, uh, work together. At that time, you were living in New York City because that's where Marvel Comics was, correct? I was living just outside the city in White Plains. It's about 30 miles north. I have this I have this image in my head since you and Louise, it seems like for me, just reading the first 10 issues or so of Power Pack, where we're at right now, that in my head, I just see that you have this close relationship with Louis Simonson, and you know, I see you having dinner with the Simonsons and, and talking about different comic books and talking about Power Pack and the Marvel Universe. Am I just crazy? Oh no, no, ab- absolutely not. They're you know, they're great friends. They're they're very dear friends, and um, they really you know, if it weren't for them, I don't know we have would have survived moving to New York. And, um, you know. They would have us over for dinner. We would go out to dinner. There were times when I, I wanted to get, you know, reference on the city or what, you know, city schools look like. And um, Wheezy would walk me around town and um, I'd take pictures and, uh, you know, and I, I would get to visit Walt in his studio. Um, and the studio he was in at that time, it was amazing, not just because he was there, but he he was sharing it with some other amazing artists um i'm trying to remember exactly who was with them at that time i think he was sharing a studio um with howard chaikin um with frank miller there was another artist there but uh yeah that that was that was a pretty amazing time to you know be in comics and be in new york city you were talking about alpha flight and i know that you've done a lot of work on some great comics besides power pack as well as New Mutants, Supergirl, Star Wars, as well as Brenda Starr and Mer- the Mary Worth comic strips. After all of you done, is what's the art or story that you still feel really close to? Well, I still feel really close to Power Pack. I mean, I, I would have to say uh, of, of all the the jobs I've done and all the, the titles I've worked on, that's that's still my favorite. Um, I, I can't really pick out any one story but um, I, I still love those characters. And, you know, every chance I get to, to draw them um, is, is something, you know, is something I still enjoy. Since you're talking about Power Pack, let's, we'll, we'll dive right into that now. There's some other questions that we want to ask you as well. But let's, let's get into this family. Did you ever base any of the kids or, this, or the, uh, any of the drawings or any of the family members are on anybody you knew? No, um, not really. I knew I just wanted them to you know, be very individual and, and identifiable, not just by their costume, but by their, their facial features and their, their body types and, um, you know, their body language. I wanted to, you know, express their personalities, but I didn't, I honestly didn't model them on, on anyone, uh, anyone that I know or any relatives. Uh, they they pretty much came from my from my imagination and you know from the way uh, Wheezy 
wrote them. Did you have a favorite uh, Power Pack story that you drew? Did any of them really jump out at you where you just said, this is this is the one for me. This is my ultimate Power Pack storyline. Oh, gosh. Honestly, I'd, I'd, I'd have to kind of look back through them. But um, I really enjoyed the – there was a, a story with um, – with Franklin from the Fantastic Four mm -hmm. and the interaction between Franklin and Katie, two really bratty little kids. And, um, and Franklin was, you know, not quite as brave and kind of vulnerable. And, um, you know, I, I like drawing little kids like that. And I just, um, I, I, I really enjoyed that story a lot. I know exactly which story you're talking about. Um, I believe it takes place uh, between 16 and issues 16 and 17. I just, I'm, I, I read a little bit ahead of where Jeff is at right now. We both, I should mention, we both own the entire series of Power Pack. And we, um, you know, we haven't reread it a lot when, since we've become adults. We started doing the show and we decided that we would just kind of read just enough ahead to you know, write our scripts and kind of see, you know, what's coming next probably. But I actually read a little bit further ahead because I was invited to go on to a, a podcast where they're talking about Secret Wars 2. And they asked me to come on as an expert. I have no idea why. <laughs> uh, but they had me come on as an expert to talk about the crossover between Secret Wars and Power Pack and Thor, speaking of Walt Simonson. But the ups the issues you were talking about happened right before that, and you're right. The the interactions between Katie and Franklin are adorable. The fact that they just have this almost sibling rivalry against each other in a family of siblings, mm -hmm. and it is absolutely adorable the way you draw them. So, I, yes, it's fantastic. Yeah, that and uh, Katie seems to be everybody's favorite character anyway. For the yes, most part, very much so, so. Yeah. it's it's kind of funny hearing all these other people and they're like, oh yeah, da, da, da. oh Katie's the best. Well, I, I I guess if I had to pick a favorite, I would probably pick Katie. Visually, she's a lot of fun to draw. Um, her power is a lot of fun, and uh, and I think as a character, I I think the fact that she's probably the most powerful one, mm -hmm. and you know to have all that power in a in a you know, little girl like that and the youngest character uh, makes for some, you know, some really interesting storylines. So she's she's really visually interesting. And as a character, I, I think she might be the most interesting one, too. It's interesting that you say that because we talk a lot on our show about how the kids view themselves and what they see themselves as. And one of the ongoing threads we talk about is how, especially Katie, always refers to herself as a monster. And because of how she looks right now, They've only met a handful of, of uh, Marvel Comics superheroes. They met Spider-Man, Cloak and & Dagger, and Marina. And of those four, we just made the comment that three of them have really bad self-images yeah. and think of themselves as monsters and how that affects the kids in different ways. Kind of going back to how you were talking about drawing the kids and making them very unique in their stances and how they move and react same thing with how they all react to these powers they have the way people see them the way they view themselves and how, how katie keeps on being called a monster or keeps thinking that she is a monster and she is the most monstrous looking of all four yeah um yeah she is i mean they're all i i i enjoy drawing all of them and i enjoy you know all their unique personalities which is that's that's wheezy's doing you know they're all so individual Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, very distinctive in their emotions and how they express themselves. And, you know, that for me just made it so much more fun to draw because of the way she wrote these characters. Yeah, she created actual like people. It's it's ridiculous just reading them and going, yeah, this is how this one would act. And this is how, yeah, these people, these are people. They have personalities. These have, yeah, it continually floors me just how well created they are. Yeah, um, and, I, and I think that's what made it, you know, what made the book unique and what made it stand out from the other superhero books. I mean, you know, there are plenty of superhero books with, with characters who have very strong personalities. I mean, what, what Claremont was doing, was doing with the X-Men at that time was amazing, but it was a much just a much more character-driven book. You are a lot of that as well, because the way you drew the characters, not like other superheroes in the comics at that time at all. You didn't have any of the muscles. You didn't have any of the, you know, 
superhero looks, they are very much kids. Even Katie, she's got the little, you know, five-year-old belly. Yeah, the kid tummy. The little kid tummy. You know, the kids have basically spaghetti string arms. <laughs> uh, you, you made them look realistic to what real kids look like. We just got to the first crossover between that you did with the Morlocks and the mm-hmm. X-Men and X-Men 195. And you've got Kitty Pride, who's not much older than Alex. She's only like three years older. Yeah, something. she's only 15 and Alex is about 12. But even she looks more adult than the kids do because you've, you've given the kids such a very precise look. And that's that's fantastic. I mean, it really goes out to your artistic talent as well as, as the writing that Louise Simonson had. I, I'm going to go ahead and call her Louise Simonson because I, she's not my friend. I'm not going to call her Wheezy yet. <laughs> <laughs> This is a a question that Rick brings up continuously uh, during our show, which is, why did uh, the kids never get masks? I'm fine with it. It makes sense to me that they don't. Uh, But Rick is always just like, masks. Why do they have masks? Masks! Give them masks! And I saw in uh, a handful of the uh, letter pages as well where people were asking going these kids need masks man so uh so what was the basis behind never uh covering up their old faces i'm trying to remember if wheezy and i talked about it i mean we must have i probably just didn't feel like drawing it (laughs) (laughs) it was probably just i i was like these these are kids i like drawing kids faces i don't want to put a mask on them that was probably it that is a genius answer i love that of course we always had the parents be so clueless yeah. you know um and i mean truly does it does a mask fool anyone so <laughs> yeah, we've uh, talked about that yeah you know, i i like i said i can't remember ever consciously making that decision one way or another uh i just never in the original design i didn't have masks i just had the, the costumes and i guess we just decided to run with that that's fantastic you know you could just have gone with our usual response blaming it on friday you know, it's Friday's fault that they that they didn't make masks for the kids. There you go. Yeah. There you go. And for the uh, parents being clueless, we've blamed that on the uh, snarks. Uh, mind probing them has like given them brain damage. Yes, right. It's, right. it's, it's canonical. They've got brain damage, so that's, that's the reason why the parents are missing the obvious signs that their kids have superpowers. I love the way the kids use their powers too. They're like, we better be careful with these and not use them around everybody. But we're going to use them around everybody yeah. and, uh, you know, fly, fly. Oh, yeah, let's be a cloud and let's disintegrate string and let's, uh, you know, degrav boxes when we're moving. So it's always great. Well, you know, that's that's just the universe they live in where, uh, you know, it's it's everything is, is very convenient and everyone's clueless and it just somehow all works out. I, I did want to go back to something you said at the beginning uh, with you really loving to draw horses how much was your love of horses <laughs> the impetus for the design for the chameleons oh yeah very much i i didn't want it to actually i based them on a seahorse i didn't want it to be like a horse a horse's head is similar to a seahorse but um a seahorse is different um it, it was definitely based on more seahorse uh, the way the snout on a seahorse looks and the kind of mane on a seahorse but then of course i gave them more like horse legs mm-hmm. um than you know with the the way the the legs bend uh so it was kind of a combination of a uh, seahorse and, and land horse and on the same token then where did you get the idea for the snarks the snarks were um really that i i credit that with my editor carl potts really uh, uh, yeah, he 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 basically designed the snarks. <laughs> um, I was, you know, I I did not have much of a background in comics. I had only discovered comics a couple of years before, so I just I didn't really my my artwork didn't really have the language of comics yet. Like I didn't understand how to do motion lines or blast effects or anything like that. My husband had to help me with it. Um, designing like a pseudo technology or aliens or monsters. I had a really hard time with that stuff. So, um, so I, I, the, the snarks are, I might've, you know, messed with it some there's probably some variation in there that that i added but the basic design came from um 
the editor of the book, Carl Potts. Hmm, it's fascinating because I'm thinking back to the first couple of issues that we read and the artwork in there. And I know that there's one in issue where they are in a snark ship and it was very reminiscent of aliens the alien the design of the inside the alien ship but looking at friday and looking at a lot of the designs and lines that you had for the spaceships i think that having a clean line kind of sets you apart a bit from how other artists really design spaceships and a lot of the alien technology so once again i think that Maybe that worked in your favor. Maybe, yeah, maybe so. I mean, it was, it was, you know, my my lack of knowledge of comics at, at times was an asset. At other times, it was it was a real handicap. I, I think it was an asset in that it, you know, my design of the characters and the costumes was, you know, I guess it was original just because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> Um, but at other times, it made it very difficult for me, the, the, especially with the storytelling. Um, I had a really hard time with that. What, what does the line go? Fake it till you make it? Fake it till you make yeah. it. Yeah, I was definitely, I was definitely faking and I got, I was in no way ready to be drawing a monthly book. I just got, I got thrown in the deep end. But, you know, I, I eventually figured it out. The first issue that involved a guest artist, uh, Brent Anderson, they actually had a nice note in there saying that, you know, you were taking a break because you weren't used to monthly yeah. books. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think, let's see, Brent, yeah, he's such a good artist. I think he did the, there was like a baseball issue. Yeah, we're almost to that one. <laughs> yeah. And I gotta and I gotta say, we, we also, I mean, we love your art, but Brent Anderson's art, it's interesting to look at it and see the differences that exist in all good ways, in all different ways. It still is amazing how he took your real design and the templates for the kids and he kept them perfect with still having his own style yeah he's he's really a good artist and he he did such a great job on that issue honestly i was glad i didn't have to draw it because i'm not a big baseball fan (laughs) (laughs) absolutely fine with me that he drew that but yeah I, i i just wasn't ready to take on a monthly book I, I was just starting out, and it was it was really hard for me to keep up with with the deadlines. Yeah, I, I really needed you know the the help of some fill in artists. Okay, yeah, that actually kind of brings us to our next question, which is that you were involved in the comic for the first sixteen issues and then uh, moved on. And so, is the story behind that that it was just uh, it was too much of a commitment, or or how exactly did that happen? Yeah, it was it was it was just uh, I had a hard time keeping up with a monthly schedule, and. Um, you know, I went on and did lots of fill-in issues, and you know, eventually I got fast enough that you know I was able to to work on Alpha Flight and keep up with that pretty well. But um, it wasn't I didn't walk away because I was tired of drawing the characters or had a falling out with Ed or anything like that. It was it was purely because I just wasn't up to um, producing a monthly book. Do you regret that you weren't able to uh, keep up with the storyline? Oh yeah. I- I wish I, you know, had hung in on the book as, as long as possible. But, um, you know, it, it's okay. I, you know, I went on to, you know, I, I drew a lot of different titles that I that I enjoyed. And um, there, I've had a few opportunities to come back and, and revisit the Power Pack characters. So, you know, everything kind of worked out in the end. I wish I had had a longer time on the book, got to spend more time with the characters. And um, I and I love working with Louise Simonson. I mean, we've worked together on other things. And um, any chance I get to work with, with Wheezy, I'm, I'm happy to do it. That's neat. So everything worked out. Are there any storylines that you would have liked to see happen with these characters? I don't know. I haven't thought about it. I know one thing I I would not like to see with the characters. I would not like to see them grow up. (laughs) Yeah. Which has has I I realize that's been done and I I think it's a mistake. Speaking of which, have have you read any of the modern comics with Power Pack in them or any of the seen any of the characters at all in any of the recent comics? No. But I, I have to confess, I don't read very many comics. There are comics that I'll look at the pictures, but I don't read very many comics anymore. I'm trying my best to keep caught up on a lot of the modern things. And I know that Alex Power currently is in Future Foundation. Future Foundation. Right. And actually, right. he was part of the Secret Wars uh, 3, where he actually kind of was with Fantastic Four and disappeared into the void. But now Fantastic Four, as of today, they've got their first issue back, which... Of course, I didn't make it out to a comic book store to pick that up. But And then Julie Power, she's been seen uh, hanging out with the Runaways, and she's yeah. got a girlfriend. Okay. So, so, kids grow up, unfortunately. 
you say you don't really read comic books that much. What do you read? Or is there anything that you are into or enjoy right now? Is there any literature that you like to read? Oh, yeah, I, I, I do read. Um, let's see. Right now I'm finishing the third book in a, a Bernard Cornwell series. Uh, I like his, he, he wrote the Sharps Rifles series, and he, he writes um, these great um, historical uh, adventure novels. And uh, I like his books a lot, and I'm, I'm reading um, the third book now in a series he wrote. I'm not sure what the series is called, but it's, it's based on a, an English archer. Um, let's see. Heretic is the final book. I, I'm sorry. I can, I'm already forgetting the name of the series. I enjoy, <laughs> I enjoy his books a lot, and um, uh, I also have to confess my my guilty pleasure is the outlander series <laughs> uh, you know I, i've enjoyed those books and um also the um the um television series as well and i you know i go back and forth sometimes between reading uh, you know nonfiction, reading biographies and uh then i you know i love a good historical novel so um i just I used to read when I was working more steadily in comics. I read more books that I have to confess. It's been a long time since I sat down and read a comic book. I do look at comics. I, I, you know, go go to the comic book shop and I, um, you know, have an account with comiXology, but as far as sitting and reading a series, mm, no, it's been, a that's okay. We um, asked a couple of our people who are on our Patreon account to send us in some questions, and we wanted to ask you a couple of those. Okay. Rustin LF asks, a lot of the body language of the kids seems pretty genuine. Did you utilize other mediums, like using kids to get the panels you wanted? You know, taking, you know, like having children of yours or your friends pose for you or, or just kind of like hang out at playgrounds and go, well, that's what kids look like when they're moving around. That question just got very creepy. Yeah, I know I did. <laughs> Were you in a white van? Did you have a sign that said free candy? <laughs> it said free kittens inside. No, actually, it was funny. One day, I, Weezy and I were walking around, and we went to uh, one of the, the schools in the city out at the playground. I just wanted to take some pictures, not of the children, but of the uh, the environment. And, boy, very quickly, one of the teachers came over and told me to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> But as far as using photo reference, no, I've I've never I've never used photo reference for for any figure drawing or or the kids. Um, I I just I love I, I find children much easier to draw than adults. Um, I find it hard to keep my adult figures looking naturalistic and not stiff. Um, I think it's just the way children act. On what the way they express their emotions, um, it's a lot easier for me to draw. So I just I don't know. I, I think it was just through observation hmm, okay. um, that I that I developed that. Okay, that's that's interesting. His second question is: How much influence did Jim Shooter or others in Marvel leadership have on the book? Was there a lot of freedom in creating story and characters? Uh, what about any push to be involved in crossovers and tie-ins? Oh gosh, Jim Shooter um, is pretty much the reason that book happened. Um, it was amazing because because Weezy, you know, she gave me her proposal. I did some sketches. We put together a. a proposal and and showed it to Jim Shooter and he was like okay yeah go do it <laughs> you know and uh shook our hands and gave us a contract and off we went and I I really don't think that could happen today but he basically left us alone um he tended to be more hands-on with the books that were selling really well mm -hmm. and the books that weren't selling as well like Power Pack he, he pretty much left us be um he, he, we were encouraged to do the crossovers to to get sales yeah. up, and that was fine. You know, it was it was fun to draw different characters. But other than that, he he pretty much left us alone. Of those uh, crossovers, did you have a favorite one that you really enjoyed the most? I, I really enjoyed drawing Cloak and Dagger. Uh, I like those characters a lot. I I always love getting to draw them. They're they're so interesting and just visually they're they're so well designed. So so that might have been my favorite. We of course have to ask uh, Dagger's costume. It's just physically impossible. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, you know that yes, that's just comic books. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of. Uh, Certainly, you know, gravity-defying costume design going on, especially <laughs> especially with with women's costumes. Oh yeah, comics. 
but that's just, you know, part of that, that suspension of disbelief that you have when you pick up a book. Yeah, our, uh, what is our three points on uh, how her costume stays together is comic science, uh, unstable molecules, and double-sided tape. Lots and lots of tape. There you go. That's it. Yeah. (laughs) It's drawn very well. Yeah. (laughs) Very carefully. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's see. Uh, Rustin's third question is, when designing characters, was there an attempt to make a Saturday morning cartoon feel, or was it an attempt towards comic kind of feeling? Uh, Because he could see arguments for both. I was not conscious of any of those things. Like I said, once again, I I had no idea what I was doing. I had never designed characters for a comic book before. And I, all I knew was I wanted their costumes to look different. I didn't want it to be, you know, just boots and gloves and underwear and belts. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want it to be a little bit different. Um, The boots they wear, this was, this, this was the early eighties. So there might've been some, you know, 80s fashion influence going on mm-hmm. in the belts. I mean, I'm sorry, in the boots. Yeah, I, I I, was just trying to do something that was interesting and kind of simple and graphic and didn't look like other superhero costumes. I love the way they look. The boots, I've always been a little kind of, eh, it works, it, it works, but it's never been fully for me. But I love the way that their costumes look. It's just, it's very clean lines. I always see it as kind of like, because me and Rick have had this argument before where he's like, they're costumes, da da da. I'm like, no, they're actually chameleon kind of uniforms indicating what their power set is. So mm-hmm. it's like, it's less costumes and more of, you know, they're, oh, this is what division of chameleon society would be in, is how I always saw it. Well, it's very, it's, it adds to the distinctive nature of each child too with the different color scheme yep. and then of course the, the the symbol that matches their power yeah in fact it works uh so well that uh one of our listeners uh a guy from england and i can't think of his name right now but he has a, a power pack tattoo on his uh upper arm which is the uh in the color of the kid and the uh symbol from their uh from their uh, costumes it's it's pretty fantastic oh wow yeah that's how strong the fandom is still is that like somebody has permanently put uh, power pack stuff on their body. Yeah, that's incredible. It's always a small but loyal following. We had another question from one of our listeners, Matthew B. He asked, which power child do you think that you would have actually gotten along with? And which did you like the most? As far as drawing, I, I probably like drawing Katie the most. So I also like drawing Jack. As far as getting along with, Probably Alex, because he's the most kind of mature and, and self-confident. And, um, you know, uh, the, the little kids, I, would, I, I, I'd be fine with them for about an hour, and then I'd want to hand <laughs> them back to their parents. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. I've always loved Katie, and then I'm kind of like, but I think if I had to spend time with a kid, I'd want to spend time with Julie because she'd be very hanging out, doing her own thing, reading a book. It'd be pretty. It'd be like, oh, yeah, we can talk books and stuff. I think that'd be pretty great. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's kind of a follow up on that. Uh, which power set would you want of the Power Kids? Well, gosh, I don't know. It might be. It would be fun to be Katie because nobody would mess with you. <laughs> <laughs> And you'd never have to take out the trash. <laughs> Alex is kind of fun because he can float around and he can lift like really heavy stuff. Um, Julie's really fast. Jack can, you know, get really small and dense. And he can get big and gassy. <laughs> yes, us too. <laughs> I don't know. Um, probably, I would probably still want to have Katie's power, being able to dissolve things and absorb. I could always use more energy. So probably Katie. Nice. Nice. Are there any properties that you would still love to have an opportunity to work on? You know, I would always like to, to go back to Power Pack. You know, every now and then I get a chance to do a, I guess the most recent thing I did was a variant cover for, it was some kind of relaunch they did. It wasn't a relaunch of Power Pack, but I can't remember what it was. It was probably one of the, uh, the, little mini series runs they had kind of alternate universe power pack with various superheroes. I don't think it was, it might've been that it was almost like they were picking up in the number from oh issue. No, no, no. I know what that is. That's uh, number 63. That's the legacy issue. Yes. Yeah. I, I did a variant cover for that. 
you know, every now and then I'll, I'll get a call to do a variant cover or a little backup story I, or, or something like that. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm always glad to um, go and play with my old friends again. Oh, that's neat. Well, I, I, th- I think that I speak on behalf of, of everybody that you should give Louise Simonson a call and you two should storm the offices of Marvel Comics and say, we demand you give us Power Pack back. We have something to say. That sounds like a great plan. I would absolutely go for that. And and with our with all the power that we hold <laughs> in our little podcast, <laughs> we'll make it happen. <laughs> Listen, it, it, it helps. You know, things like this, just any, you know, I, I'm always glad to to you know be a part of anything that that keeps the book out there and keeps the keeps the characters alive and um people aware of them so yeah you guys in this your little podcast uh you're definitely a part of that i'll tell you that part of the reason that i originally decided to reach out to you was there's another podcast that's very very popular called j miles explain the Mm x-men And they go through all of the continuity of the X universe. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> uh, that podcast has been gone on forever. They're on episode 200. <laughs> um, and they, do, they don't do single issues. They do story arc runs. And, they, yeah. and they're to the point in the mid-90s now where they're going back and forth between multiple issues. Wow. But for their 200th episode, for their 100th episode, they got Chris Claremont on. Yeah. And for the 200th episode, they got Louise Simonson on. And okay. and while they were interviewing her, she kept talking about Power Pack and she was going oh, on and on and on about Power Pack. And at one point she apologized to them. She goes, "You know, I know this is an X-Men podcast and you guys have questions about X-Men and X-Factor, but I love Power Pack. It's the one I created and I just am so happy about it." And I had sent in some questions to the show because I'm a fan of their show. Uh, they actually started in Portland, Oregon, where we are. And uh, J. R. R. Miles said, well, we just found out, actually, that one of our fans has started a Power Pack podcast. And Louise Simonson just said, oh, my God. Oh, this is amazing. This is wonderful. Uh, you know, if they ever want to interview me, they just have to reach out to me. Uh, I was at home jumping up and down and screaming uh, because it, it's amazing to see that, you know, what we can do here and that some of the some of the emails, some of the people that have reached out to us and said, you know, thank you for doing this and hearing Louise Simonson be excited about it. People love this comic book. I know that when I was younger and collecting it, my friends who also collected comic books kind of sneered at me a little bit and said, why are you reading that kid's book? And I said, because it's good, because I like it, because it's fun. And because I can imagine myself in these kids shoes. And There's a lot of people that found a lot of different things to hook on with these kids, you know, whether it was something that they could just, it it spoke to them about something and happening in their lives, or it gave them a little bit of comfort, or it gave them just that little bit of inspiration to what if I had powers, or what if I was out of whatever situation I'm in right now. It spoke to a lot of people. And you mentioned earlier that, you know, it wasn't a big selling book, may not have been, but it had a hardcore following. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, the people that it sold to really stuck with it. It seemed to really make a big impact on their lives. Uh, where there, you know, one guy he wrote to us and he was like, and we were talking about how long. Oh, the, a follow up question on that. But he, we, you know, he was saying, yeah, in uh, one of the letter pages, they kind of discuss how long uh, uh, light, you know, or light speed. She doesn't travel at light speed. I can remember that, but I can't remember my anniversary. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. But oh, this uh, this is an excellent follow up question: Is how long does light speed rainbow last? Because I've got a couple of answers for it, but none of them are official. So uh, Probably until you turn the page. Hey! <laughs> one of my answers was uh, it lasts a panel. Okay, yeah. A panel or a page. Yeah, I like that. And my other one was uh, it lasts four minutes and 13 seconds. And the reason why? Is because of uh, Ronnie James Dio's Rainbow in the Dark <laughs> song is four minutes and 13 seconds. So. That's as good as any. Yay! This is the kind of silliness that you can expect on our show. <laughs> <laughs> in our podcast, uh, we end each show by interviewing my seven-year-old daughter. So I thought it'd be kind of funny if I asked her to come into the room and ask you a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. And what is her name? Her name is Carrie. And first of all, she wanted to tell you, too, that she thinks that your last name is very cool. My last name? Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. Well, thank you, Carrie. Go ahead and introduce You're welcome. Yourself. My name's Carrie. 
My favorite color is pink, and I love my parents, and and I also love my cats. I love cats too. I have three of them, and I'm allergic to them. So is my dad. Oh, you're allergic. Here, you know how many cats I have? How many? I have ten cats. My mom would probably not be able to get ten cats because me and Daddy are allergic to them. Yeah, I don't. I don't recommend having. <laughs> I used to know a couple that used to take in every cat that would come around. They had 22 cats. I really hope to God I never get to that point. I, I... It was it was ridiculous. It was just, you'd hear just this thundering throughout the entire house as just a herd of cats would go run, just running around corners and everything. And it's like, wow, this is a lot <laughs> to take in. <laughs> How did you draw all of these characters so well? Well, I just love to draw and I just practiced a lot i started drawing when i was really little like like your age and that was how i entertained myself instead of um watching tv or playing video games i would just sit and draw and um and then when i got a little older i started studying and i studied um perspective and anatomy and then i looked at lots of comic books too and i studied how other artists drew and um, tried to be as good as them. And um, I just practiced a whole lot and eventually got pretty good. Which character is your favorite? I think Katie. I think Katie's my favorite. She's probably about your age. And uh, she, she's just a lot of fun to draw. And I like that she gets in trouble, but she's like super powerful. Yeah, me too. She also is my favorite too. Yeah. Which villain in Power Pack did you enjoy drawing? Which villain? Um, well, probably the Boogeyman. He, he was fun to draw because he was just kind of this, you know, this, he was kind of goofy and scary at the same time. So he was a lot of fun. Yeah, we're, we're coming up to the ones with him. You've seen him a couple times. That's Carmody, remember? Oh, right. Right, Carmody. yeah. Let's see. I want to be an artist when I grow up. Could you teach me if, if we ever see each other? Yeah, sure, sure. I love to teach art. Um, I, I've taught I taught art for two years at a school called the Joe Kubert School of Cartoon Art, and I taught for nine years at a school called SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design. So I love to teach art. Figure out what you like to draw. If because like when I was little, I liked to draw horses. So. I found some really good books on how to draw horses, and I studied those. And then I studied real horses and photographs of horses. So figure out what you like to draw. Maybe you like to draw cats. I like to draw cats, dogs, and fishes. See? And you've got, you, you can look at your own cats and draw them, and you can maybe find a book about how to draw cats and learn from that and just keep practicing it. And before you know it, you'll be really, really good at drawing cats. Do you have anybody else besides your cat and your family? I have my husband, Roy, who we work together. I draw the pictures in pencil and then he finishes them in ink. Um, but I don't have any children, just just cat and a horse. What's the horse's name? Well, the horse I, I ride now is named Molly. I've heard that name on a, of a horse before. Yeah, I think a, I think there are a lot of girl horses named Molly. I have a follow-up question about your cats. <laughs> uh, are you you're not like in a studio apartment or anything, are you? <laughs> oh no, no, uh, no. I have we have no. It's it's not that bad. Um, there are, are eight cats in the house. There's one outdoor cat, and then I have a studio that's separate from the house and there's there's one cat here my that lives with me in my my studio okay are you on acreage or something or just uh no no not not acreage. they're all indoor except for the the one outdoor cat thank you okay have fun drawing cats and comics it was nice talking to you kiri it was nice talking to you too bye <laughs> bye yeah, I, I'm making good use of all my, my cat inspiration. Um, I have a book coming out in October called Captain Ginger, and it's being published by a new company called Ahoy Comics. Um, it's written by a, a writer named Stuart Moore, who um, is a 
old hand at comics. I've, I've worked with them before. And um, mm -hmm. let's see, I guess if I were going to pitch it, it would be basically, I, I, I he says it's Star Trek with cats, but I think it's a little darker than that to me it's more battlestar galactica with cats okay oh you have our interest this yeah. sounds fascinating <laughs> it's oh. a really good story um i mean people have been asking me if it's like a kid's book not exactly i would say it's an all ages book <laughs> you would go in with captain ginger and uh <clears throat> talk you know it's like oh okay i was imagining like a you know the tall ship with uh with a cat as a captain and then you go and oh it's in space okay this is getting different and then yeah, yeah it's, a science, it's a science fiction book okay and uh, i mean it's it's definitely an all ages book but it's not like a, a little kid's cat book Okay, is is this going to be a uh, a limited? I can't remember if you said is it a limited run or is it going to be a? It's four issues, um, but I I think we'll we'll probably end up. I, I'm just finishing up drawing the fourth issue right now, and uh, I think we'll probably end up doing four more. Oh wow! So the the first one comes out in October. Okay, so is it going to be? Is it like at the uh, the mark that you're finishing right now? Is it kind of the end of a, a storyline, and then you're going to pop in with a new storyline or? end of a story arc but it's it definitely leads into another okay is there anything else that you'd like to plug besides just that that's that's about it i i also i i currently i draw a, a comic strip called mary worth that runs in the newspapers every single day <laughs> 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 uh, so i'm gonna guess uh daily workload so that's my other gig okay so mary worth daily mary in worth. the papers it, and it, captain ginger and you're doing that with your husband correct yeah he's my he's my anchor on um, mary worth he is um the anchor and, and letterer and he's also inking captain ginger as well well that's nice yeah we've got a little cottage industry going <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming you get along very well with your husband <laughs> you know we we work really well together because we leave each other alone i he knows what he's doing i know what i'm doing and we just we we leave each other alone you know that is actually some of the best relationship advice i've ever heard <laughs> Leave each other alone. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. They know what they're doing. There's the end of it. There you go. <laughs> We've been together for hey, 40 years now, so I guess it is good advice. <laughs> I know you're over on the East Coast and we're over on the West Coast. Uh, if there's ever an opportunity that we can see you at some Comic-Con, trust us, we will be there so we can meet you face-to-face. -face. I would love it. I've always wanted to do, um, like, uh, of course, it's not. You're in Portland, right? Yes. yes. Kind of just up the road. I've always wanted to do Emerald City. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I've never done it, uh, except for, no, I've never done a, a comic book convention in the um, in Northwest. So. Yeah, there's Rose City Comic Con that's fairly big. Rose, yeah, C like Rose City Emerald Comic Con City. is very big here yeah. now. And, and yes, Emerald City Comic Con, too. I mean, I don't do very many conventions. And when I do, it's usually on, on the East Coast coast i'll do like um oh, i'm in atlanta so dragon con um oh small small conventions then uh, yeah oh, actually i i i have to, my husband keeps trying to talk me into going back to dragon con and i'm just like oh god i have friends that go to it but i think they go every other or every third year just because they're kind of like we need the downtime from it yeah, it's it's intense yeah. it is and i'm gonna go to baltimore uh, this this fall, and that's probably about it. But I, yeah, I would I would love to come to a convention out there. Well, if, if you ever do get a chance to come out here, I mean, Portland is wonderful, as long as you miss the rainy season. Um, <laughs> it's beautiful out here, and and we would love to see you. And like I said, if we ever get a chance out to your neck of the woods, we'll try to see if we can find one of the cons that you're at, so we can see you as well. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much. We'll let you go and. We really, really appreciate this. Yeah. Thank you so much, June. This has been really, really great. Thank you for asking me, guys. This was fun. We like to wrap up the show by doing a couple of shout-outs to some of those listeners that took the time to write in and leave us a review. Big shout-out to the irredeemable Shag from the Fire and Water Network. He left us this message. Gee, I dig it. Been a fan of Power Pack since issue number one was released. Bought most of the issues, and in later years, bought the All Ages series and read those with my kids. Even owning the issues and having them digitally through Marvel Unlimited, I've been buying the trades. 
because I'm crazy and apparently not responsible with my money. We hear you, man. We hear you. Yeah. He also says, keep up the great work. Looking forward to more episodes. So are we. We've got a couple in the hopper and we're ready to feed them to you. He also offered to promote our show on his network. And who are we to refuse free publicity? He also left us a great review on our webpage for episode number eight. On Twitter, I always notice Tim and Alexander liking our tweets and providing us good feedback. We appreciate your early and ongoing support. Tim also left us a couple of fantastic messages on our website for episode number nine. We're pretty sure that Friday broke into a car wash to clean off the Hudson River before breaking into the museum. I mean, that would just make sense. Another thing that would make sense is hands. Friday's got hands to wash up with. <laughs> Kyle C. on Facebook let us know that he is still loving this. He's been rereading some of the issues. And because of Jeff, he can't read any of Jack's dialogue in anything other than his Jack old man voice. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yeah, we've got a little thing going on with that where I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm a spry eight-year-old boy, dang nabbit. And he's like, whatever, Mr. Button. And I'm like, Mr. Button? Benjamin Button reference. That's genius. And I laughed myself laughingly. And I also want to do a shameless plug for my sister-in-law's new book that is coming out. All You Can Ever Know by Nicole Chung. It is an amazing autobiographical book about her struggles with being adopted, her search for the people who gave her up, her discovery of her sister, and the birth of her own child. It's going to be available the first week of October. A reminder that Rose City Comic Con will be held the weekend after this post, September 7th through 9th. So Jeff and Rick Present should be there sometime during that weekend, hopefully talking to other podcasters, comic fans, and creators. We hope to see you there. And once again, we want to thank June for her time being on our show, but also we want to thank her for the amazing work she did on Power Pack. Your artwork and Louise Simonson's stories really touched and influenced a lot of people. Jeff and Rick Present is a bi-weekly self-produced podcast recorded in front of a live studio audience in Portland, Oregon. If you'd like to interact with us through the magic of the internet, you can do so through Twitter at Jeff Rick Present, our Facebook page, Jeff and Rick Present, our email address, Jeff and Rick Present, all one word, at gmail.com, or at our website, Jeff and Rick And if you would like to help support our show, we are on Patreon. You can find us at patreon.com, Jeff and Rick Present, all one word. Please rate and review us on iTunes or Stitcher. Tell your friends about us or share your love for us on social media. And as always, we want to thank the wonderful women in our life. My wife, Cindy, and our daughter, Carrie. My fiance, Hillary, and our daughter, Aurora. We, we love, love you. Until next week, costumes off. Our theme music is 80s Action by Kevin McLeod at Agapitech.com and is licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 license. And how it impacts your art in the story. Are there ads in comics? <laughs> you know, they're really subtle. They're really, really subtle. Why, uh, why would I've, no, I, I've noticed one why or two. Why would put an ad in a comic book? <laughs> except for the sea monkeys i have to yeah, oh. admit, everybody does love sea monkeys yeah i'm a big fan of the x-ray specs and the uh go from uh what is it the the wimp to macho yeah nobody's yeah. kicking sand in my face how to go from a zero to hero yeah. <laughs> uh early on in our concept we decided that we were going to drink a beer for each episode that we are for each issue that we read and i was going to find a beer that somehow matched up with something in the comic book. yeah a thematically appropriate beer yes because there's nothing more appropriate than drinking beer while reading a book about four children <laughs> i agree and you know, I, I, had i known i would have gone back in the house and you know got myself a guinness oh you are a woman after our own heart. We love you very much. We're stout drinkers too. Yeah. Oh, that's actually a great spot. Is it Bob Wycheck? Wycheck, that's correct. Yes. yes. I had to re I researched that and I heard uh, him being introduced at uh, a panel and just this person breezing past his name. And I, I swear I listened to that like for 20 minutes, just yeah. going, how do you say his last name? How do you say his last name? Since issue one, we made a decision about Jack that the way that he sounds like, it's a cranky 70-year-old man. So, yeah. Jeff, yeah. if you will, please. It's, it's just due to the fact that he's very curmudgeonly with people. So it's always like, nobody expects the great mass master. Oh, you big slime brain. That's, that's perfect. He, yeah, he's definitely an old man at heart. <laughs> yeah, I yes. called it good. <laughs>